to first uh, go around the room, we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists for this evening's event. Um, Alice, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Oh, there I am. Hello. Good evening. My name is Alice Weissglass. I'm a software engineer here at Benchling. I've been with Benchling for almost five years now, and I've spent that time on our customer engineering team which is a team here at Benchling dedicated to integrating the platform with external teams and databases and machines. Uh, I have an interdisciplinary degree in computer science and studio art from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I have experience in 3D modeling and printing, game design and video platform infrastructure. Uh, because we're talking about gender here, and I expect this will be relevant to some of the questions, it's also important to know that I'm transgender and a transgender activist. I sit on the board of San Francisco's historically queer synagogue. Uh, I volunteer with trans kids, and I co-founded Benchling's LGBTQ employee resource group. Wonderful. Thank you, Alice. Maritza, would you like to go next? Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, Maritza Diaz. I'd like to introduce myself first as telling you who I am. Uh, I ha I'm a mom. I have two little girls who are my inspiration. I'm also an immigrant, and it has a lot to my why, but I'll tell you that later. Uh, and what I do for a living is I'm a software engineer. I love computers and all this stuff that we can do with it. Uh, I've been in the industry for almost 30 years in software, and 20 plus of those years in life science, where I really learned to love the fact that geeks like me can combine computers with science to make an impact in people's lives. And so that's, uh, that drives me. So nice meeting you all, and I'm excited about having a conversation here with the team. Thank you, Maritza. Dana, would you like to go next? My name is uh, Dana Calder. Um, I kind of describe myself as a, a chemist by training, but a software engineer by accident. Um, at some point, uh, when it was time to get a real job, I got my hands on a keyboard at my first job and realized it was like instant gratification that you don't get at the lab bench. Um, so I've been in this career ever since the intersection of uh, science, uh, scientists doing their job, and the software systems that they need to um, you know, do great science. Uh, I'm currently at Genentech. Uh, I am in the GRED organization, which is Genentech Research and Early Development. So that spans basic research through to phase two clinical trials. Um, I'm the executive director of a team called Research Informatics and Software Engineering. And basically, my team builds a lot of the software that our scientists use to do their day-to-day -day science. That could be anything from a system to register samples or track animals, um, track uh, plate-based experiments and uh, things like that, all the way to the sort of more dry lab data science side of things, so data platforms for uh, managing genomics data, um, et cetera. So it's just a fun place to be at this intersection of very cool science and uh, engineering and technology. Thank you. And what inspired you to pursue a career in technology? And how did, how did you get started? Feel free. Anyone can answer first. Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, when I was nine years old, I wanted to write a text-based choose-your-own-adventure, so I stole my older brother's C-sharp uh, coding book and learned just enough to do if statements and input and output and uh, wrote a very bad text adventure. I uh, joined my middle school robotics club, and the rest was history. I love that. Um, I had a very similar situation too, where you know the, the first things you learn if else statement. So I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I, I guess I can share my experience, and I wish it was better. Um, I grew up in Ecuador, where, as you can imagine, back in the day, uh, there were no many computers, especially at home. I never, never owned a computer. So, however, my parents uh, were always telling us all my my siblings and I that we needed to have an education, that we needed to go to university. They didn't have that chance, and so they were really making sure that we will. So the day to register for um, university came, and I'm standing in front of this 
this person and she's telling me what career are you going to choose and I'm like I don't I'm not sure it was an accident like like you <laughs> and she said well uh, I see you have good grades in math and this and that, and, and they're like, we have a lab with computers. Do you like computers? I'm like, I don't know. So anyway, long story short, it was luck. It was an accident, and I wish it wasn't that way. Um, role models are very important and part of the reason why we're here, I think, today. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Maritza. And uh, for me, I, I, mean, I was always a science and math nerd, like in middle school, high school. Um, I'm going to date myself. I had a Commodore 64, and I could make my name scroll across the screen. That was about it. Um, but like, I just kept going to school for chemistry because I had a great chemistry teacher in high school. She said, go to work in this lab when you go to undergrad, and I did. And then when I was finishing undergrad, um, the professor I was working for said, oh, you should go to grad school. So I did. And then you'd go to postdoc, because that's what you do. And then, um, then you have to actually make a decision, I think, about what you want to do with your life. And I realized it was not chemistry. And so then I asked my graduate advisor, well, what should I do? He was on the scientific advisory board for a small biotech. They wanted to hire someone who could understand science and translate that to something that their software engineers could do something about. And he said, you're good with computers. Why don't you go talk to them? Um, so I did. And that's kind of how I landed in this field. Thank you. And how, how did you come to be in this domain that you're in? What, why biotech? Would it be cliche at this point if I said it was an accident? <laughs> uh, I genuinely, in a Rube Goldberg machine of coincidences, uh, accidentally applied to a software engineering headhunting agency uh, called TripleByte. They no longer exist. I found that out right before this, and I'm a little sad about it. Uh, they had an embedded ad. I thought I was taking a BuzzFeed quiz. Turns out it was the first round uh, interview for a company. Uh, they agreed to represent me. They represented me to a suite of startups uh, in their whole system. They had exactly three that had anything to do with the arts, which, again, what my degree was in. Uh, and I threw on a random biotech scientific collaboration tool I had never heard of and a random healthcare company I had never heard of, really just to fill out the week. Uh, this was in the days when they flew you out for on-site interviews. So I flew to San Francisco on a Sunday. I had an on-site interview every single day, and then I flew back to Baltimore, where I was living at the time, uh, that Friday night. Uh, by the end of the week, I never wanted to hear from any of the three arts companies ever again. They were all terrible for their own special reasons. And I was absolutely heartbroken choosing between Benchling, which is where we all find ourselves seating today, and uh, Datavant, which was the healthcare company I had never heard of just down the street. Um, but I got here and couldn't get over the energy of it. I never quite got over my um, hero complex, I want to save the world, art major, whatever that is, and bringing drugs to market faster, especially during a global pandemic, was uh, quite motivating. Um, my experience with how I got into life science, I will describe it. It, it was similar, it was a, an accident again. Because you know what happens is that we don't think about life science as a first choice when you're in technology. The first thing you think about is Google and AWS and all of those tech companies. So I was in, still in, in college and this company called PricewaterhouseCoopers was recruiting for the best students to become their trainee program. So I went to work for them, and as part of this, this program, they assigned me to a client, which happened to be Agilent Technologies. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. I never heard of this company. Um, long story short, I moved to the US uh, when I was 22 to work for a project at Agilent. And I really enjoyed my time there. And then later, I started working for uh, Life Technologies. Um, out of Rockville, close to Baltimore. Um, and then they, be they became um, life, uh, life is Thermo Fisher Scientific. So that's where my journey started. And as in the beginning, I was literally just doing back-end stuff, like 
ERP, CRM, that kind of thing. But as my career progressed, I really had the opportunity to work in, with R&D, product development, and that's when my love for this industry became real because I was seeing the impact firsthand of the work that I was doing. So again, it's uh, something that we, I, I didn't plan. Um, just happened to be at the right time at the right place. Um, and then once you find that, that industry, it's very hard to leave. So I obviously started in, the, in that industry because I started from sort of a scientific perspective, but I stay for that very reason, which is um, that at the end of the day, you're not trying to like optimize an ad to target someone. You're actually helping some of the smartest people in the world, right, discover the next breakthrough that's going to like save someone's life and your family. So there's really this tangible impact. So I think that's why I'm there. Yeah, in terms of your industry, yeah, seeing, being able to see the fruits of your labor, I'm sure that's incredibly enriching. So, and what do you believe? Um, what do you believe are the most significant recent advancements in biotech and engineering, and how have they impacted your work specifically? Um, scale and <clears throat> networked labs. This is very much a function of my role. My job is integrating machines into Benchling's core platform, trying to slurp up as much data as possible. So, of course, I'm going to say scale and networking. But we have clients, we've seen clients who have like greater than one to one machine to scientist ratios. The level of automation and high throughput scale that we're seeing in some of these labs is really inspiring to me and only going to accelerate. So for us, um, at ITJ, we work with life science companies to help them deliver their product to market. And one of the biggest challenges and in, in, in also things that we're proud of is that these products are in fact saving lives. And, and so think about a patient who is wearing a device that's dispensing medicine in the body. And this is all controlled by software, right? Which sounds great, but if that software has bugs, that patient could die. And so having that sense of high, this, this has to be really high quality. The engineering that we're doing, the code that we're writing needs to be working 100% of the times every single time. So it, it is exciting to be able to work in products like that, but it's also a lot of responsibility, and hence the fact that as an engineer, you need to double check, triple check, make sure that your testing is correct, make sure you're, you're, you're writing the right test. It's not just a test because it's a test, it's the right types of testing. And, and again, somebody, some patient is benefiting from this, um, this, this high quality product. So um, that's very exciting. It's challenging as well to make sure that everything is, is ready. The FDA uh, is always um, making sure that these products are safe as well. So working in a regulated environment is challenging, particularly for software engineers that are used to um, CI, CD, right? Release your code immediately, uh, not so much in, in our industries because, again, of the criticality of, of the product. So it can be a challenge for folks that are used to just move fast. In our industries, it's not, not so fast. Uh, yeah, especially, yeah, a lot of iteration, a lot of testing, definitely necessary. Definitely. I'm going to steal actually a bit of a story from Daphne Kohler, who you may know from Coursera, or one of the founders of Coursera, but she's also the founder of a company down on the peninsula in Citro, which is um, doing high throughput uh, biology and utilizing AI and ML methods. Well, she won an award at last year's Grace Hopper. And she gave a keynote and she pointed out that, you know, there have been some major um, eras that we know have transformed a society. So the microprocessor era, the internet era. Well, the era that we're in right now is the era of digital biology. I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have gotten to a point where we can measure the human body at an individual cell level. And so we are generating massive amounts of data. And biology is basically, at this point, becoming a math problem. Um, and a data engineering problem. And um, 
you know, all those instruments that um, Alice pointed out, like I think we're at the point now where similar to sort of in the, um, you know, server kind of industry, I don't know if you were cattle, not pets. We need to treat the instruments in the lab as cattle not individual little handcrafted pets. Um, and so because we need to systematically be getting all of that data up to a place where our scientists can actually um, discover and, and find interesting uh, insights in them. Thank you. And then in the rapidly evolving fields of biotech and software engineering, how do you stay informed and, and adapt to new technologies and trends? Do you guys have any? resources you'd like to share? It's hard. Uh, I try to follow the joy. I find myself surrounded by brilliant people and try to seek them out. I find people whose eyes light up when they get excited about something, and then I just get them talking. And I just ask questions. It hasn't failed me yet. Uh, similarly, for me, I think is, is the network. is uh, surrounding yourself by people who are in the industry and, and re really listening and learning from them. Um, I'm very fortunate to have clients that are working on the most fabulous products. And so when, when they're telling me about their products and the technologies that they're using and the innovation, it's just very inspiring. I think that's probably the best way to learn is by, by creating these networks. Very important. You can always read and, and go to school and whatever else, but the best way is to Talk with people, network, and be curious, ask questions. And um, for me, it's similar to what, what Alice said, which is to kind of follow that joy. And like, I'm surrounded by a lot of incredibly uh, smart scientists. And so I think it's focusing on the problems that you have to solve first and foremost, and then trying to find the right technology for it rather than I think what we often get hung up in is you know the shiny new object um, and then trying to find a nail for that hammer um, and so if you really focus on the problems not the technologies I mean the technologies are a means to an end at, at some point um, then I think that's how you can make sure that you're focused on the right new technologies to be putting your uh, learning effort into yeah, that's really great advice thank you and going back to you, Dana, Dana, you received multiple awards related to leadership and development. Because collaboration between scientists and engineers, it's cr quite crucial in biotech. Do you have any thoughts or advice on how leaders can best foster interdisciplinary teamwork? Uh, and to what I was saying just a second ago, like, at some, there's a problem in the middle of the room. And like, why, so focusing on why are we here, what each individual's expertise needs to come to bear to solve the problem, I think is the best way to get people working effectively together, um, you know, versus sometimes it feels a little bit like a tug of war, like am I right or you right or is this yours or mine? But if, if you really do focus on like that thing in the middle of the table that if we pulled that off, like what impact that would have, I think that's the best way to anchor people in, you know, effective collaboration. Right, a shared goal would make it a lot easier to collaborate, definitely. And then I'm going to open up this question to everyone. Would any of you like to share examples of successful cross-disciplinary projects that you've been involved, with, involved in with your uh, respective organizations? I can, I can, I can share a success story uh, with one of our clients. Um, they were uh, two years, no, three years ago now. Um, they just got an approval from the FDA to release uh, this um, new and revolutionized uh, pump delivery for insulin. Uh, and when you get the FDA approval, it's when the rush comes because you have to deliver first to the market. Now, in those days, uh, COVID started, as you all remember, and this, this client of mine couldn't hire fast enough uh, because everybody else was trying to hire the same software engineers. Um, so anyway, we came in and helped with the software engineering part of it. But as this device also is a hardware component, we needed to collaborate with the mechanical engineers, with the electronical engineers. And then we needed to know the science of it, like what is, what is the algorithm to dispense uh, uh, diabetes in the human body? Uh, so it, it truly became a combination of all of the hardware, 
the science behind it and the software piece that uh, combined delivered this product. Now, not being able to be in person was a little bit of a challenge, I would say. Um, but we, we, we did it. We, we delivered that product today. That product is a, one of the fastest growing for any medical device in recent years. And they're accelerating the use um, uh, in the US and globally. So we're all very proud of what we did in the end, but it was very challenging, particularly because of the, this real-time connection uh, and the cross uh, functionality. Um, but similarly to what you guys just mentioned earlier, it was, we had one goal. We needed to deliver this device, and that drove us. So um, that's, uh, hopefully that, that helps answer uh, your question. Definitely. Uh, I have to talk about Benchling's partnership with the Allotrope Foundation. The Allotrope Foundation, for those of you who are not as deeply plugged into the minutia of data modeling in biotech as I find myself these days. The Allotrope Foundation is a consortium of professionals from across the biotech sphere who are dedicated to standardizing the formats that data comes off of lab machines. It is minute, granular work at the edges of data standardization. It is not glamorous, and it's unbelievably important. If you can try to imagine building an internet where every single link you built had to be researched with documentation written 30 years ago by someone who was no longer at the company, that's kind of what it's like trying to integrate with lab machines. They all speak their own languages. They speak like eight different languages within one manufacturer. And there are no standards. There are 500 standards. There are 14,000 standards. Uh, it's a mess. And Benchling has committed to building a suite of open source connectors to adapt some of these most popular competing standards into the single unified allotrope format. Uh, and we hope that the rest of the biotech scientific community will join us in that endeavor as we uh, try to standardize the way that we get data readable. I'm really excited. And then, um, I'm going to direct this question to Maritza. Maritza, you were recognized as two, uh, 2022 CEO Rising Star by San Diego Business Journal. What advice do you have for emerging leaders aspiring to make an impact in the biotech and engineering sectors? So I mentioned I have my two daughters, and they are my inspiration. And the bottom line is, and it sounds cliche, but my advice is do what you love, because when you do what you love, you don't work a single day. It, everything, everything becomes easier. And so that's how I drive the company. Um, I left Thermo Fisher after almost 20 years. It wasn't an easy decision for me. And I remember my husband was like completely opposed when I told him, I'm going to leave Thermo Fisher to go create this ITJ company. <laughs> he was like, no, you're crazy. Um, and a little bit of crazy is, is good. Um, and, I, and you follow your passion. So I convinced my husband that it will all be OK. And if all fails, I can always find another job. So also be confident about what your, you can, your skills and what you can bring to the table, right? Take risk. So I did. It was a very risky move. And later that I knew, COVID came. And then I was like, oh my God, my husband was right. <laughs> How do I tell him he was right? <laughs> uh, but again, it, it was that motivation that I really wanted to be able to tell my kids, look at them in the eye, because they always ask me, right? Especially during COVID, they would walk in the door as I'm in a Zoom meeting, and they're like, Mom, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm in the meeting. So they always ask me, what do you do at ITJ? And I could try to explain to her, oh, we're writing software, or we're trying to build this product to market, but that, they wouldn't understand that. So now I can honestly look at them in the eye and say, you know what? Mommy is changing people's lives. And so they ask me, why? How? 
And, and the way I found my passion is in two, way, two fronts. One is the products that we are building are impacting people's lives directly, right? So, wow, what an impact. But the second passion that I found as I started working more and more in this is um, my company provides jobs for people in Tijuana. And I don't know about you guys, but if every time I ask somebody about Tijuana, they will never tell me, oh, that's a great software or tech hub. And so the result of that perception was that nobody will provide a job for engineers in Tijuana. So they were overlooked always. And with, with my company, we are providing, bringing these great jobs for people who are hungry for it, who will do their best, and they will appreciate it forever. So I realized I have this fantastic opportunity to give back in some way to my community. I'm Hispanic, I'm not Mexican, but I'm Hispanic. And now I'm bringing these jobs of the future to people that were overlooked, and they do a fantastic job. And so I love when Thanksgiving comes or, or uh, Christmas Day comes and I get a text or two from engineers that I have worked in my company and they told me, Maritza, thank you. You changed my life. So follow your passion. Thank you. And you know, at ITJ, what strategies do you use to attract and retain top talent given the high demand uh, for skills professionals in these fields? Very competitive market, right? That's not a surprise. Um, but I think what, what works for people who want to be in the long run here, it actually applies to me as well, is the impact. The job you do will impact life. Somebody will benefit from the work you do, and that that is priceless. You cannot pay anybody enough to do that kind of work. Um, so that's very important. That's why we partner with life science companies always, because we can attract people who are passionate about making an impact. The second thing is we do hire a lot of students and kind of young engineers. And for them to be able to have a career path and have somebody that really cares for their development is very important as well. And so we spend a lot of time on coaching, mentoring, training, and making sure that every day they become better and better and better. Um, so we invest on those two things. Those are my two major factors why people will want to be with us. Money is not a good, is not a good indicator because next month somebody's gonna offer them a few more <laughs> dollars and, and if they decide to go, then they're probably not the right person for this industry. I stay at Thermo Fisher for 20 years because that passion, the impact. And so that, that has worked great for us. Thank you. And Alice, um, I'm gonna direct this to you. You co-founded Benchling's Queer Employee Resource Group and you were the recipient of Benchling's Equality Champion Award in 2022. Can you share examples of initiatives in your organization that have been effective in promoting diversity and inclusion in tech? I have to talk about formalization. When I joined Benchling, Benchling was 85 people, and Benchling's LGBT employee resource group was like four friends having lunch. We swiftly became not 80 people, and what works when you're four friends having lunch doesn't work as well when you're a company that's um, over 1,000 people today. Have we, have we broken 1,000? I'm getting, I'm getting an ish. Uh, I have to shout out Ronnie McGee, our amazing head of DEI, as well as all the other ERG co-leads uh, who have built a system that leaves room for grassroots organizing while also still having formal structure, a budget, executive sponsorship, events that get executive pushes and company eyes on it. Uh, Flores had an event just this morning. It was a TEDx talk by uh, one of our employees on the pink tax and uh, the ways that it is expensive to be a woman 
in general. Um, we have a bunch of amazing ERGs that have grown up all out of employee-driven desire to have a place. Uh, and I don't want to list them off because I'm afraid I'll miss one and I'll feel really bad if I miss one, but uh, know that they exist and they're great. And that formal system is what has allowed them to grow up. Thank you. And, you know, in, in that same vein, you know, I'm directing this question to all of you. Um, what unique challenges have you faced as a woman in the tech industry and how have you overcome them? Would you like to go first, Maritza? Uh, sure. Um, well, it's not secret women in technology aren't, aren't too many. Uh, in fact, when I, when I went to college, I was one of three in our classroom. And when graduation day came, I was the only one. And that ha has been, for many years, the, uh, I'm, on, I'm the only one. Whether it is I'm the only woman or I'm the only Hispanic, <laughs> Uh, certainly, I never met anybody that was a CEO of Hispanic, so no role models. Um, and that needs to change. And, you know, I, when I think about that today, about my own path, I made it. I, 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 I am, quote unquote, successful. But I had to always rely on, on not just me, but others. And it wouldn't be much easier if it was somebody that I could relate to, that I could have a conversation about, how did you do this? Because you're kind of like me. Um, but that wasn't the case. I, I did have a lot of mentors and sponsors. Sponsors are very important. Sponsors are not mentors. They're very different. And they believed in me. They saw something in me that they helped me uh, progress my career. But it is always a challenge, and it's very lonely to be the only woman in the room, to be the only Hispanic or whatever minority you identify with. Um, now, the challenge, right? Now, how do I went about it? My way to go about it is just don't think about it. When people ask you, what does it feel like to be a woman leader? I'm like, well, oh, I am a leader. Uh, it doesn't matter if I'm a woman or a man. I don't want to be labeled as this women leader. Uh, I am a leader, regardless of what gender, and that's my view. And that's kind of how I kind of overcame and kind of like ignore, ignore that loneliness, and it just it has worked out for me. So for me, um, I think earlier in my career, I think I got through, but I got by because I was pretty much oblivious to like anything going on around me from a, a gender bias perspective. Actually, in retrospect, having done one of these implicit bias tests um, that's looking at like humanities versus STEM and men and women, I'm like in the 1% of the population that strongly uh, associates women with STEM because I think I had just amazing teachers in middle school and high school. Um, but at some point, my eyes were opened, and I realized, like, why are there so few of us? There are still way too few of us. Um, and even, and I don't think we've really solved the problem yet. Um, I mean, actually, within a few months ago, I was at an event with my uh, colleague who was actually reports to me. He's a tall white man. And when we were talking with someone else, they said, oh, are you in, you know, blah, blah, blah's team? And I'm like, no, actually, he's in my team. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, we have a long ways to go, um, and I think at, at some point it just takes perseverance, and just we're gonna fight the fight. So I warned you I was gonna talk about trans stuff. I transitioned in college, and I got to watch in real time as strangers who originally saw me as a freshman, who didn't know anything, but saw me as a boy, trusted my technological knowledge way more than they did when I was a senior and they saw me as a woman. And I had four years of very rigorous education from a highly accredited university and they trusted me way less. That has followed me through my professional career. I have been asked, uh, I've been in rooms with non-technical male clients who get the technical question and have to be like, I gesture over to me because they're not technical. They don't know the answer to that question. Um, 
it's very frustrating. Uh, so how did I handle it? I just got so good at my job that no one could deny it. <laughs> no, that's a joke. Um, part of what I did is I dyed my hair blue and I wear a leather jacket and punk artsy clothes. I learned pretty early on in my technological career that the people around me were going to have an intuition that I didn't belong. And I made the active choice to push that to the forefront of their mind. Bias is insidious. Unconscious bias is really hard for people to root out. And I am more comfortable if I make if I can make it so obvious that it comes to their conscious mind and I can be almost aggressive about daring them to think that I don't belong. That's not gonna work for everyone. That is what works for me. Thank you. You know, and something that I personally experience um, with um, just for example, my dad, he always, he's, he actually asked me, he's like, can I come to the event and help you set up? Um, how can I support you? So my question to the group is, what can men do to be better allies and advocates for gender diversity in the tech industry? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I'll just say one thing, because this is still coming up. I am so tired of being the one who has to point out on seminars and you know lineups for conferences and town halls that you know there's no women on that that meeting like men need to start paying attention and counting these things and calling it out i'm to be honest i'm tired of always being the one calling it out i would agree with that and, and you know the reality of today is, is that the sea level are men <laughs> so they need to have that conscience the uh, mindset of we have to make a change um, to to bring more women to those type of roles. So they, I, I mentioned earlier, I, I did have people who believed in me and they were sponsors and champions and mentors. They were all men, okay? So men are fabulous allies. And I wish we had more men here tonight. This is women who code, but we, again, men are in those key positions and they are willing and open to help. Uh, my experience was that, right? So I, I think of who were my best managers in there were men. Um, they, they absolutely need to be our allies, otherwise not, there will be no change. Um, we also need to, uh, at least when we are in positions of leadership and when we are hiring people, right? I hire people all the time. I make sure that I always bring women into my, my company. Even when the perception might be, they don't know much, right? They always think that the women, for some reason, knows less than the same student ma male. Um, I bring them. Today, um, and this is something leaders can do today, uh, managers. In my organization, we have 50-50. Because I want those women to also make the same impact the same decisions as they are hiring for their new teams, they should remember that they need to bring women, so kind of create that network effect. Um, but we're far from it. But I think it's the, at all levels, women and men, leaders, and let's bring more men to this type of events because they need to hear it. As a trans activist, I'm legally required to say respect names and pronouns and uh, ask for them and uh, do all of those things. The spicier answer to this question is that men need to actively make the choice to assume competency of their non-male colleagues and coworkers. Uh, unconscious bias is big and hard and difficult to root out, and it is going to require what feels like a conscious overcorrection to address. That's my spicy answer. Thank you. And to everyone, can you share personal stories or experiences that highlight the importance of diversity in tech teams and 
the positive outcomes they can bring. I legally changed my name a couple years ago. The hardest system, including government systems, to change my name in was my Amtrak customer rewards. Harder than social security. I am not joking. It had just never crossed their mind that somebody might need to change their name. I can only assume that that was not a malicious oversight and was instead made by a room full of men who had never had to update their name in any system for any reason. Um, how hard is it to update your username in the products that you build or work on? How hard is it to update an email? Do you ask for chosen name and pronouns before you send out company-wide welcome emails? These are small quality of life changes that aren't going to fix the big structural issues in society, but might make someone's day a little better, or at least prevent them from having a really bad day. So one example I could share is it's actually very eye-opening as you start working with products that you think will work for everybody. Software it just should work for everybody. Um, when you work with patients, you start, it, it is part of the group that we have, right? They know these other things that we as software engineers don't ever think about. We, we, we build a screen and the UI, UI UX designer was, well, what about uh, colorblind people? And we're like, do what? Oh my God, we never thought about it. As software engineers, you just don't think about those things that are very important to other groups. Uh, similarly, with uh, cultural differences as these products go into markets uh, in Latin America compared to Asia or compared to the U.S., um, some of the labels need to be on this other side because it's, it's just all eye-opening when you're building a product that is going to be used across the globe by everybody. And if it's a patient that needs to get this medicine or this treatment, it has to be able to be understood really well by each patient. And so for us, as we develop software and we started to learn about these different factors, uh, it has been really eye-opening. It's like, wow, we needed to think about these types of users that we never thought existed. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more work to do in, in across. It's not just gender, right? This is an example of uh, different types of groups that are so many cases are forgotten. I think just to sort of generalize that, right, we live in a product kind of centric world. There's, we, we build things for people. So the people that are going to use our products, um, we need to actually make sure that our teams of people who are building them represent the diversity of the customers that we serve. And that, you know, can be for software. That can be for the medicines that we're, we're building or the medical devices. Um, because if you don't have that diversity of perspective from all kinds of angles, not just gender, right, you're not going to have all the great ideas in the middle of the room to you know, actually figure out how to solve that problem the best way. It was recently, it reminded me of something with the genomics. Uh, most of the genome sequence out there is white male. Right, and so how are we ever going to cure disease for black, African Americans, for Hispanics, or other other groups? Right, so it's just at, at, at the core. Systems are the same way, I think. Right. I'm going to talk about one more thing, which is how tech can be unexpected vectors of abuse. Uh, GitHub had an issue oh, a few years ago now. Uh, where you could be added to a repo or added to an organization without your consent. That doesn't seem like a big deal. You're just getting added to see some code until people started using it to send threatening messages or unpleasant images to people who had blocked them on all other forms of social media. This is the kind of thing that you have to preempt and have to think about and... 
it's hard to do that with only one kind of experience in the room. And I'm gonna pivot a little bit. Um, I'm asking everyone here, uh, what are some key skills or areas of knowledge that women should focus on to excel in tech roles? Okay, let me, let me try answering that. And, and I, honestly, I don't think it's, uh, it's a question of male, female. Uh, I do recruit a lot of people. I recruited almost 1,000 software engineers. So I think I have a pretty good idea what we look for in software engineers. And, and I can tell you it's not about the hard skill. The Python or Java or whatever technology that's uh, involved, you guys can learn at any time. And technology changes so frequently that that hard skill is not necessarily as important as it is the type of soft skills that you have. So for example, for a software engineer, we look at learning agility. Why? Again, technology changes so fast. And if you have somebody that can easily learn on their own, that's not expecting somebody to give them a, the answer, then you want that engineer in your team because he or she can quickly learn. Um, so that's just one example. We, we have a variety of soft skills. Another one is, is collaboration, team collaboration. Software is a team sport. Um, we don't write code alone. We, we use practices like pair programming or even code reviews, right? And so being able to have a conversation with your peers, with your teams, and how are you gonna solve this user story? And who's gonna take what task? Um, that's team effort, uh, and again, in, this, in the software world, we have a common goal, and so we have to be able to collaborate with the senior, with the mid-level, with the associate, with the product owner, the scrum master, all sorts of different roles and personalities. Um, so if, if someone can't collaborate and wants to be on this corner working by himself or herself, then that's not a good match. So focus on your, on your soft skill abilities. They will be very important. Technology, you guys can always learn. You stole my answers. <laughs> uh, I had a whole joke about theoretical math and how important that was, and I was going to go into uh, learn how to learn fast. And uh, the big problems in software engineering today are not, by and large, at the cutting edge of theoretical discrete mathematics. They are problems of communication, problems of collaboration, problems of working on the large systems with a lot of people, with a lot of competing interests, and building something that can adapt and change to all of their needs. Um, there's a lot more in common between software engineering and an English major than tech fetishists would like to admit. And I'm in a plus one to both of that because that was actually my answer too. Um, and you brought up English and it's funny, I tell my daughter who's 17 that as much as I hated my AP English class in high school, in retrospect, that was the best skill skills that I learned was how to communicate and communicate effectively in writing because it is all about collaboration. It's about um, being able to describe the problem. It's about being able to communicate or like break down a very large complex problem into smaller ones that you can tackle. Um, uh, another, like a specific collaboration skill is how do you co-create or solve a problem with other people? Um, it's very different to come to a conversation with, I think my way is the right way and your way is the wrong way. Um, it's different to say, like, I have some ideas, I'm going to put it out there, like, what are your ideas? And, you know, being able to ask curious questions about the other person's perspective, like, well, why do you think if we did it that way, it would be better? Um, I, I think that curious questioning to try to really genuinely understand another person's perspective on why they may be so passionate about, you know, their idea um, is really important because if people don't feel heard, um, then they're not really going to want to work well with you or not work with you at all. And, you know, when it comes to communication, when it comes to collaboration, I, I definitely agree. I feel like those soft skills are really important. Um, 
it's, it's very important to be able to decompose a problem. It's very important to be able to hear someone else's side of why they may be in favor of using a certain tool or going through um, or taking a certain approach or technique. So thank you. Thank you. More important than analyzing the work and span of a Haskell function, which is what my answer was going to be. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask one last question. Um, We'll go ahead and start wrapping up. But you know, I have one last question for the group. How do you see the future of women in tech evolving? And what changes would you like to see in the industry over the next decade? This is kind of a, you know, probably fantasy, but it'd be funny to see and nice to see at some point that the, you know, there are more women's names on the conference speaker list or you know the scales are tipped slightly towards the women uh, versus the men just because it would prove a point that it's possible um, i don't think we need to go to that extreme but I, I i think it's very interesting every once in a while when i walk into a room and i'm like wow there's only women in here that's pretty awesome <laughs> um, Yeah, I, I would love to see that they come come through, um, but I, I do I do see some some changes that I I didn't when I was a software engineer for organizations like Women Who Code, right? Phenomenal. And this is all volunteering, right? So we we are passionate about spreading the word, helping other women, and like Women Who Code, there are many other organizations, Girls Inc. and all sorts that did not exist before, so. We all need to support in any way. Uh, that's why we're all here, um, empowering, creating those um, um, role models. Very important. Uh, hiring, right? Some of you will be in leadership positions one day. And remember, remember to bring more women. Be mindful and conscious about it. Um, so I, I do also share your, your vision that someday, there will be more women um, in leadership roles in, in science and technology. And we are awesome. We have a lot to bring to the table. We just have to believe it. And I think to believe it, we need to have those role models and those people who are bringing us closer together. And organizations like this are making a difference. Yeah. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was once asked how many women would need to be on the Supreme Court before she was happy, and she said all nine. Uh, so I like your answer. Uh, I think we're still at the beginning of the fruits of a couple decades worth of labors. After school programs, things like this. A um, couple decades of pushing for more women in STEM, and they are now we are now, I am now, here. Um, I hope we're not just dropped at the threshold and told to fend for ourselves. Um, I hope that support and mentorship are something that continues throughout people's careers and people's lives. Um, I hope we can continue to build a more equitable future. Thank you. And so that wraps up our panel discussion. I just wanted to say thank you, Alice, Maritza, Dana. Thank you so much for sharing with the group your insight on all these questions. I feel that this is definitely going to move the needle when it comes to diversity, spreading awareness on how we can support women in tech. So just thank you so much.